Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to Iowa Ed Chat Live. We hope that you have had a fantastic day with your families, and we are bringing you the latest educational news each month, and we are pleased to be able to connect with you tonight. We have a very special guest joining us tonight. The Pirate, Dave Burgess, is here with us, and we're going to have a lively discussion. We're really looking forward to that. As you can see, tonight's chat will have a live video stream. And we'll be taking questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via our hashtag on Twitter at hashtag IAEdChat. And we will be monitoring this feed. So please do not hesi hesitate to share your thoughts with us. We will get this live show on our podcast later tonight. If you have not checked us out on iTunes or Podomatic, please subscribe today. Connect with us that way. At this time, I am going to introduce our team. My name, and I will start with myself. My name is Dan Butler. I am an elementary school principal at Epworth Elementary School in the Western Dubuque School District, and I'm going to kick it over to my man, Colin. Hi, my name is Colin Wicken. I am currently uh, Dean of Students by contract, um, supplemented with the associate principal um, interim tag this fine school year. And next year, I will be the uh, associate principal in charge of activities. So moving into a new role next year, at Bettendorf High School. Uh, Andrea, our third member, uh, is unable to make it tonight. She's in Sin City, uh, enjoying uh, some time with friends. So um, I will take the next moment to introduce our very special guest, uh, Dave Burgess, uh, who I reached out to via Voxer, and he so kindly took uh, time out of his extremely busy schedule to spend this evening with us. So I just wanna start with a huge thank you to Dave uh, and uh, I know your time is valuable and precious, so uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, oh, Dave, my pleasure to join you. Absolutely. So Dave is a teacher from San Diego, California, and a professional magician specializing in stand-up comedy magic. He was a 2001 and 2012 Gold Mapper winner in the Gross Mont Union High School District and the 2000-2008 Teacher of the Year at West Hills High School. He has been voted faculty standout for 17 consecutive years in categories such as most entertaining, most, most dramatic. He specializes in teaching hard to reach, hard to motivate students with techniques that incorporate showmanship and creativity. Uh, at a recent ceremony in Washington, DC, he was awarded the BAMU for secondary school teacher of the year by the Academy of Education, Arts and Sciences. He is the co-author of P is for Pirate, Inspirational ABCs for Educators, and the New York best-selling author of Teach Like a Pirate, which has sparked an educational revolution around the world. Dave is also the president of Dage Burgess Consulting Incorporated, which publishes powerful and innovative professional development books and has currently completely disrupted the traditional publishing world there is a good chance that some of your favorite education books are published by Dave and his wife, Shelly. So once again, thanks, Dave, and welcome aboard. Hey, I'm excited to be here with you guys. And thanks so much for having me on the show. Absolutely. I will pass it off to Dan uh, to get the discussion started tonight. You're muted, Dan. I'm not sure if you know that. Well, now I do know that, that I was <laughs> muted. So thanks, Colin. Appreciate that. But we're really jacked up to have Dave. It is certain to be a lively discussion with him. He has just got so much passion to bring to the table. And we're looking to hear from that tonight on Iowa Ed Chat Live. So here we go with the first one, Dave. Talk to us about your background in education and really what has brought you with us today. Yeah, so you know what? I was late to the game in education. I, after graduating from college with a degree in psychology, I went and tried to do all kinds of different things and uh, fought teaching. Everyone said, hey, you should be a teacher. I fought it tooth and nail. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. And uh, then I ended up getting a basketball coaching job at a high school and uh, didn't even have a teacher credential. Coached basketball there for a while. Loved working with the kids so much. I ended up going back at night to night school, getting my teaching credential. Um, and then I taught for 17 years at West Hills High School um, here in San Diego. I was a U.S. history teacher primarily. And while I was teaching at West Hills, uh, I began to travel, started doing the Teach Like a Pirate workshops and seminars. 
and uh, then eventually uh, made myself sit down and write the book. And so, uh, and then that kind of exploded the speaking business more and then um, the publishing and all that. And so that's what kind of what brought me here. So now I travel around, do the Teach Like a Pirate workshops and try to find uh, powerful educators and help them get their message into the world too. That's awesome. Thanks for kicking us off, Dave. Now um, to the audience again, as you have questions for Dave, we would love to engage in that live discussion with you. Go ahead and submit those through our hashtag IAEDChat. We will make sure that we monitor that and hopefully we will get your questions asked and answered by Dave. And if we're not getting questions, we're just going to go off the things that we prepared for Dave. And uh, at this time, Colin's going to go to the next one. Yeah, Dave, I'll, I'll be honest. My first year as an administrator, I read your book, Teach Like a Pirate. And I'll tell you what, I almost went back to the classroom uh, because I was so <laughs> fired up about <laughs> the content and the message and if, if anybody out there has not read teach like a pirate i can't say this enough read it buy it get it, <laughs> it, it it's it's really good stuff so of all i appreciate that call absolutely my friend and, and one thing i will say about dave is i tweeted at him probably five years ago and uh just telling him you know one of the biggest takeaways i, I gotta buy tickets to your own to, to a 10 year old classroom and uh, I um, tweeted you that, and you responded to me uh, in, in an extremely timely manner. So I, I, you don't understand what that means, and that is a testament to you and or what you do. So uh, I appreciate that connectivity that you have with your, your, your fans and, and those people. So of all the, of the choices of something to brand yourself with, uh, you chose a pirate. You know? So can you tell us a little bit of why, why the pirate? Why, why is is that the Burgess family? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So here's the deal. Um, I'm kind of obsessed with finding ways to package material to make it easier for people to understand. I did it with my students, and I, I call it putting handles on material to make it easier for kids to pick up. I always want to put handles on material to make it easier for the kids to pick up. So when I came up with the workshop, I wanted to have a theme. I wanted to have something that I could uh, structure it around. I wanted to be able to model and demonstrate some of the tactics from the that I was talking about in the workshop I, that I do in my classroom, I wanted to do them in the workshop. Like if you think about it, it's a lot of pressure. If you write a workshop description that says that you're gonna teach teachers how to create an outrageously uh, engaging classroom that has kids knocking down the walls to get in, you better have a pretty damn good workshop, right? It better be a pretty engaging workshop. So I wanted to be able to use the costume hook. I wanted to be able to use the interior design hook. I wanted to be able to have props and different things like this and mnemonic devices. And so uh, pirates appealed to me because pirates are unconventional. They're willing to reject the status quo. They're willing to sail into uncharted waters with no guarantee of success. They're risk takers, rebels, mavericks. And so it's about embracing the spirit of being a pirate. So it has nothing to do with wanting teachers to attack and rob ships at sea, right? It's about the spirit of a pirate. And so uh, then also pirates are known for having hooks. And this was all about how all the different ideas I have for how you could hook students into your content, into your curriculum, and draw them into what you're doing. So I like the hook analogy, right? And then uh, in addition to that, it's also an acronym. So P-I-R-A-T-E is an acronym. Each one of those letters stands for something in the pirate system. Like I, I knew I wanted to talk about passion and enthusiasm. Well, there the P and the E were sitting at the beginning and the end of the word, like the cornerstones of it, right? And I knew I wanted to talk about building rapport with kids as being sort of like the heart of teaching. And there the R was sitting in the center, like the heart of the word. And so I never looked back. I did the Teach Like a Pirate workshop. The first time I did it was like in 2005, actually, for uh, a summer uh, group in my district. And then I began to go anywhere where anyone would listen to me to talk about the pirate ideas. And so that's kind of... Oh, where it started, and that's where the uh, the metaphor came from. No, that's that's great. I, it makes even more sense now, so I appreciate that. Uh, I will pass it over to Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, are you fired up? I mean, is it, does this guy bring any enthusiasm to the game at all? I mean, so it's it's bound to be just a great conversation this evening as we really dig into it and again i'm going to remind you if you want something asked go ahead and throw it in our hashtag we'll monitor that and we'll get it asked for dave but dave you started going down this road with your previous answer but talk about how you create the environment in your classroom and school where students want to get in rather than wanting to get out yeah so you know one of the key tenets uh, of teach like a pirate is uh don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. 
And I think that's kind of what a lot of it goes back to. It's like if you walk in my room and you sit down at a desk in a straight row and I stand up in the front and I lecture you about prohibition and speakeasies, well, that, that's a lesson, right? But if you come to my door and you find it locked and then you have to knock, dunk, 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 and it slides open six inches and you see me standing there in a pinstripe gangster outfit, right? And I'm asking you for a password and you don't get in unless you know the password or you go find the password. And then when you do make it in, you're immediately hit with 20s music, but it's too dark to see. And then you enter through a little curtain that wasn't there the day before and the whole room's been transformed. You recognize nothing and your eyes are adjusting to the accent lights. And then you think you might see a bar in the front. And, and that could be a bartender up there, actually. You go up and you order a drink, you get served a drink, and then you go sit down at a table that's got some gambling items out on it. That is an experience, right? Don't just teach a lesson, create an experience for kids. Lessons are easily forgotten, but experiences live forever. They may forget some of that prohibition lecture, but they'll never forget going to the speakeasy. So it's always saying, here's my content, not good enough, so what? How do you make it come alive? How do you make it memorable? How do you create the kind of environment that has kids desperate to come back here tomorrow too? And so we're always looking to try to create experiences out of our content. I love it. I wish I was in history right now. I wish I was not 37 years old. I wish I was back to being 17 and uh, going to history class because when I learned about the prohibition, it was not like that, man. It was not like that. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. Yeah, my no, pleasure. I, I, I definitely wish I, I could have sat in one of your classes. Dave. I, <laughs> your passion is about coming through my computer screen here, so uh, that's awesome. So talk to us a little about, about what does it mean to teach and lead like a pirate? How, how does one accomplish that? What, what are the next steps? What, what can any teacher do to bring what, what you bring to the classroom? So it's also about embracing the mightier purpose of being an educator. And so like we're, we're in the life changing business, quite literally the life changing business, right? So we're about a mightier purpose than what outside forces want to drag our attention towards, sometimes successfully, I might add. And so it's kind of like we, as individual educators in the profession, have to kind of stand strong, say, well, no, we're not just about the bubbles and the circles and all that. We're going to have a life-changing impact on the students in front of us who go on and have that impact um, in their communities, which, of course, ultimately influences the world. And I always tell people, like, you can't measure a teacher's effectiveness with a standardized test score, right? Our effectiveness can only be measured through generations because that's the kind of impact that we have with our kids. And so it's not just about raising test scores, it's about raising human potential. And so you're always looking for those, I call them LCLs, life-changing lessons. What are the life-changing lessons that you can add into your content? You know, So uh, a, a lesson about Lincoln becomes a lesson about overcoming obstacles and perseverance. A, a lesson about Rosa Parks. Like, yeah, I want them to know about the Montgomery bus boycotts, but more importantly, you know that an ordinary citizen, not a president or a general, like an ordinary citizen can change history, right? And so there's all these different ways you can take your content and wrap around a larger message and then that's when it becomes really easy to come to school in the morning because it's uh it's pretty easy to get pumped up to come to school when you're talking about changing lives so dave uh we do have a question from karen norton and you started going down this road as well but we'll give you the opportunity to explain a little bit more she says she asks how do you keep the high level of energy what motivates you yeah, so the, the, that last answer might be a part of that. It's, the, it's, the, it's that greater, that mightier purpose of being an educator and understanding that it's not just about, like, hey, I, I didn't get into education to teach about the railroads, okay? Now, the railroads might be one of my standards, and it might be something that I am going to teach in my classroom, but really the reason I got into education was to have, uh, to create relationships of influence with young people. And so, um, like, for example, but here's the problem. We don't get to choose who we have an influence over. They get to choose whether they're going to see us as the kind of person that they're going to allow that power in their life. They, they get to choose whether they're going to see us as a role model. And so I'm pumped up about going to school and trying to connect with kids and trying to have those relationships of influence, though that, that mighty purpose of being an educator. As far as the energy level, like if you saw me outside, if you saw me walking in between classes or something to the lounge or something like that, you would think I was a three-toed sloth. Right. I'm just kind of like shuffling along. But then when I get in front of my class, I, I know how to, to click it and, and, and turn it on. Right. And so like I, I have a commitment 
when I step in front of kids, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be on fire. I'm gonna light, I'm gonna light myself on fire. And then we talk about this in, in T Lab. One of the things is like the steak analogy, and that like you don't serve a raw steak. If you served a raw steak to people, they wouldn't be very happy with you. They wouldn't eat. It's not edible, right? And so you got to turn on the propane. You got to bring a little heat. You got to bring a little energy to it, and then, and then it becomes edible. Same thing is true for kids. We don't serve them raw steaks or raw content. We have to turn on the propane. And so I have a commitment that when I step in front of kids, like I'm, I'm going to douse myself with the gasoline of enthusiasm and spark it with the flames of inspiration. I'm going to light up when I step in front of kids. And so... Um, and the way you do that is two, kind of two things you do. One is your physiology. Your physiology is a shortcut to your state. Like if you want to be a more dynamic speaker, then move in a dyna more dynamic fashion, right? If you want to be more enthusiastic, then act enthusiastic. And so then, and then it's, a, it's, a, it's like a short circuit to your brain. When you move your physiology in a certain way, it's, uh, you, you can change your state. Much like we know that if you get a book that you have to read and you go put a pillow under your head and you lie down on the bed, you're likely going to fall asleep, right? Um, but the same thing in, in uh, the way you can control your your physiology in the classroom too. And then the other way you control your state is what you focus on. So if you focus on more empowering things and um, those life-changing lessons and all that, then that's something that can always keep you excited and fired up as well. Crank up that propane, man. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Hey, we've got another one. And this question is just more about workshops. And Brandon, excuse me, I think it's Brandon Adams. Any workshops coming up in the Virginia area? Uh, I think I do actually. Um, so you know what? I think I'm going to be at Roanoke College in maybe maybe even June. So I think I am going to be in Virginia for sure. Um, coming, I was just in I was just in Roanoke recently, and I, I think I'm going back to Roanoke College real soon. Good deal, good deal, Colin. I think you're up from the script. Are you not? I don't know. Uh, or is it me? I think you are. Okay, so Dave, another question that we've got for you. What does it mean to be relentless in leading your classroom, in leading your school? What does that mean to you? So it's about, so relentless is one of my favorite words. And so it's like about, here's the thing. Uh, Malcolm X said, called it by any means necessary. Right, and I think we need to have a, um, a by any means necessary attitude towards education. Uh, teaching is a game that must be played. It's a poker game that must be played all in, right? And uh, so it's not something that you can you can't half ass education and teaching. And so, um, like, I, I I ask an awkward question sometimes in my workshops, and it, it's it always is met with uh, avoidance of eye contact and uh, fidgeting and uncomfortable movement in the seats. And they don't want to look you in the eye. And what I ask them is really simple. I just say, do you want to be great? And you know what? Educators don't want to answer that a lot of times because somehow saying yes feels selfish or egotistical or like, who are you to be great? Right. And but we're in the service profession. Right. And so our, uh, if you put in to, to be great takes extra time, energy, effort, soul, blood, sweat. Right. And if you put in that extra time to really excel and to really be good at what you do as an educator, how much extra money do you see in your paycheck at the end of the month? Zero. <laughs> you, you, you see zero. Right. And, and so actually in education, seeking greatness is the most unselfish act of all. Because you do more, but you don't get anything extra for it. Like, but what you do get is you get to have a larger impact on your kids. And so a sense that you gain that way. And also, it is for you, too. Because who wants to be average? Who wants to be mediocre? I have a section in the book that says, mediocrity doesn't motivate. Like, who, who wants to get up in the morning and say, you know what? Like, you, you shut off the alarm clock and you say, man. I can't wait to get into my building today and be mediocre. Like, I'm just like, I, I can't wait. I'm going to get my, I'm going to get showered up and get to school and, uh, and just be as, and be lukewarm today. Like lukewarm sucks, right? No. So, uh, it, but when you seek greatness and we really go for it, then that's something that fires you up. Like too often people don't have big enough goals. You have to have a goal big enough. That's going to motivate you. And so it, um, I think you should, there's nothing egotistical about seeking greatness. It only impacts your, it only helps and impacts your student. It's a, it's not a zero sum game. It's not like the, the better you get, that means that the teacher next to you got worse. 
right? It's a, a rising tide lifts all ships. And so your greatness not only is going to help your students, but it's also going to, to, to raise the bar, the level, the standard in your system and, and help pull other people up with you. And so it's sometimes teachers get into this game where they think that's some sort of competition. No, we, we all should be seeking greatness because it's all for the kids. That's awesome. That, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. We'll keep we'll keep rolling here. <laughs> Yeah, Dave, you make a great point that, you know, you as an educator seeking greatness doesn't bring anyone else down. It actually assists and helps people, you know, come up. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, hey, so, Colin, yeah. do, you mind if I, do you mind if I just jump in there on something else on that same, Absolutely. on that same time? Hey, Please. check this out. I, I, I hear about this all the time in social media. And so since this is you know, tied to a social media chat, I, I want to I address this too. And I've talked about this before, but maybe some of the people in the chat ha haven't heard me talk about this. Here's some, there's two reasons why people don't share more on social media or they struggle to share their stuff on social media. The first reason is because they don't think what they're, they're doing is that unique or special or, or worthy of sharing. And that other people probably already do this. And because they, maybe they have kind of a, a tunnel vision view of what they do in their classroom, they think that everyone else is doing the same kind of stuff and the truth is is that's not true you are doing stuff that's unique you are doing something that's special and you are doing something that's worth sharing and and so you you need to share out what you're doing when it's successful and, and even if someone is already doing what you're doing they don't read your tweet of your or your blog about what you what you're doing and say oh my god why did they share that I already do that no it just validates their practice and plus there's a whole group of people that are sitting on the fence they're on the edge they want to try something creative something innovative they see all this stuff happening around them in education but they just aren't ready to take that leap yet and when you show your journey your leap your risk that you took and also share some of the failures along the way to get to where you went where you got to um, it, it encourages them to step forward and take that leap and that risk and that jump with you and so that's one reason why people don't share and the second reason people don't share is because they think that it's egotistical selfish or that they you know it's like a oh I don't want to act like what I'm doing is so special and and this is misguided as well. And here's what I tell people. If you have something that works, if you have something that if you shared it, it would help other educators, it's not just okay for you to share it. You have a moral imperative to share it. Are you, you have something that, that works and is successful with kids and you're not sharing it because of some issue you have with not wanting to stand out, right? That makes, that, that, that makes no sense to me. You have a moral imperative to share. And then I even go further and say, now this is over the top, but I'm kind of an over top guy, right? <laughs> and so like if you're at a party and it's crowded and someone on the other side of the room falls down and, and isn't breathing anymore and, and you know CPR, and you don't want to say anything because you don't want to stand out. You don't want to like, oh, I don't want to act like I'm a know-it-all and all this kind of no. Like it would be ridiculous. Like you, would, you would make it loudly clear and easily known that you know CPR. You can help that person. And by the way, you would immediately start making your way over to that person. And even if you had to push a few people out of the way on your way over there, you would do it because this person needs your help, right? And, and people wouldn't look at it and go, look at this bully pushing their way across the room. They would say, look at this hero trying to get over this body, right? And that's the way it is in education, too. We have kids literally suffocating and not breathing in, in systems all across the world, right? And, and they're bored out of their minds, and they, and they need help. And if you have something that can help educators get to the, reach these kids, it's okay for you to do anything in your power. Now, you, you shouldn't just not only share it. But you have to take the time, the energy, the effort to get good at sharing it, too. And so that you can build that impact to amplify your impact. You're doing amazing things in your classroom. Now you have to get good at amplifying your impact and getting good at sharing and spreading your message so that it can, it can reach more people help, and ultimately help more kids. That's a great analogy. You know, <laughs> I, I, you put it in perspective when you, when you use that example. So we have another question from the audience, and I'm sorry to do your last name, but Jared Kuberski asks, um, how can you be progressive in the classroom when district leadership is not? So um, <laughs> there's, there's lots of ways to answer. There's lots of ways to answer this, depending on how confrontational we get, right? But uh, so uh, I would say, that there's a decent chance 
that my district leadership had very little idea what I did in my classroom. And um, I, I went and I did my thing. And I had an attitude uh, early on that I, uh, I'm going to teach in the most powerful way that I know how. And if at any point I can no longer teach in the most powerful way that I know how, then they're going to they're gonna have to drag me out, right? And so, and I know that's kind of a confrontational answer, but that's the way I looked at it. Like I, I, I'm going to, if I think I know, if I think I'm doing something that's successful and powerful kids and I can see the results in my classroom, um, that, that's, that's the way I'm going to do it. And, and then I'm also, I would, but I would also say that one of the things, uh, well, a lot of the fears of, of uh, having administration not support something like a teach like a pirate style philosophy are uh, most of those, I have not seen that to be the truth in general. And I've seen great support from administrators all over the nation, the world for teach like a pirate strategies. And if you think about all the things that an administrator has on their table, on their radar to worry about in their system, the idea that you as a teacher who's passionate, as a teacher who has kids fired up about learning, as a teacher has fewer kids in the front office with behavior problems because kids actually like being in your room and, uh, and, and has kids excited about school, the idea that you're going to show up on their radar as a problem to be addressed as opposed to something to be celebrated on their campus, it doesn't ring true to me in general. Uh, I've seen a, a, a amazing support from administrators for Teach Like a Pirate. Um, and the other thing I would tell you is if you're worried about evaluations, people coming in the room when you're doing something that's unusual and strange and different or maybe falls flat or you know, looks odd, um, I, I don't think the answer is to not have administrators in your room. I think the answer is to invite them in more often. So if the only time an administrator comes in your room is when it's for your evaluation, well, then that is kind of a risky proposition for you, isn't it? So that's why you should, whenever you have powerful things that are happening in your classroom, you should invite them in to see so that they have a larger context to view your teaching in. Have conversations with them about the, ped uh, the pedagogy behind what you're doing and why, it, why it's powerful and why it's working and how excited kids are so they can see kids light up in your classroom. And so then when, when the, then when an administrator does come in and they see something fall flat or something really strange, they have that bigger picture of that they've been in your classroom multiple times over the course of the year and they, they know that good stuff is happening in there. And so I think the answer is to get them in there more often rather than to, to, um, to, to have to worry about that. <laughs> so this is a good uh, follow-up question with that, Dave. Uh, so how, how do you, uh, as a teacher, how do you transform your classroom? How do you, how do you make it into the, the teach like a pirate philosophy? Uh, so it's, uh, the, first of all, it comes from questions. The questions you ask will determine the kind of lessons that you build, I always tell people. Like if you want to change a teacher's classroom, change their questions. If you change the questions that they ask, you can change their entire classroom. And, and like, so E.E. E. Cummings said, always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. And I believe that 100% to be true. And so it's the questions that we ask, that's what generates the creative. So if you wanna have a, it's not that we don't have creative teachers, it's that sometimes we don't have teachers who are asking themselves a creative brand of question. So that, that's part of the thing. But it goes all the way from, uh, it goes from the very beginning to the very end of that you layer these hooks into what you're doing to draw kids in. So, for example, back to the steak analogy, right? So, like, if, if you were really coming to my house for steak, I would have contacted you before you got there to find out if you even eat steak. And if you didn't eat steak, I would have provided you a suitable alternative, right? But, but, even, but even if you did like steak, before it got there, I would have put a little rub and seasoning on it. Then I would have soaked it in a flavorful marinade. Then before I put it on, I, I would preheat my grill. I, I don't put my steak down on a cold grill. I preheat my grill, right? Because when you drop your steak on a cold grill, nothing happens. But when you drop your steak on a preheated grill, what happens? It, it sizzles, right? So like, I want my content to sizzle when I drop it. So I always preheat the grill, mystery, curiosity, buzz, anticipation. And then uh, when, when I served you your meal, I would offer you a side dish to go with it, a beverage to drink. And then after all that, I'd offer you dessert, right? And that's what we would call a meal. 
And, and that's what we would call a dining experience together, right? But in education, people just want to go plop a steak out on the table in front of kids and expect them to like it. No, it's got to have the rub, the seasoning. It's got to have the marinade. It's got to, the grill's got to be heated up first. You got to put the energy to it. Then you have to have some side dishes to go with it, some beverages, some desserts. And all those things are what really makes a learning experience for kids. And so too much of education, we're concerned about uh, just the content. Like, what's the content standard that we're going to cover? And, and, and not enough on the presentation of that content. And how are you going to make it relevant for kids? How are you going to make it? Uh, how are you going to make it challenging for them? How are you going to make it so it draws them almost magically or mag magnetically into what you're doing in the classroom? So it's all those things around the edges that create that teach like a pirate uh, environment in your classroom. What? <laughs> I absolutely love fired up, man. I am fired <laughs> up. Got to make it sizzle. See, so, people, people, people will say to me, they'll say like, so uh, you, you're not into the um, the content standards? And I'll say, <laughs> like, I'll say like, no, like you've totally misunderstood the message. Teach Like a Pirate is not anti-curriculum, nor is it anti-standards. It's saying that's not enough. That's the bare minimum. That's where we start, right? We're going to do all that, but now we're going to go further and we're going to make it amazing. So we're going to teach our content, but we're going to go further and we're, and we're going to also have the idea that we're going to make school amazing for them too. Fire up that propane. <laughs> all right. Um, so we've talked a little bit about what it takes to be great and that commitment. And we have talked about how it's somewhat easy to be average. So this question, you've started to answer this a little bit within your conversations. Um, within the conversation tonight, but how do you get the average teacher to lead like a pirate, to employ these different things, the average person to push that, particularly I'm somebody, I'm really pushing the envelope, I'm driving some stuff home, but my colleagues are not. How do I amplify that impact as you talked about? So one thing is exposure is sharing, right? And so um, we, we work at a really strange profession in that, um, so I've taught with some people for 17 years and never saw them teach one time. Never saw them teach because I'm teaching at the same time. And so like we will pass each other at the, um, getting the stuff out of our little mailbox cubby for 17 years but we don't never seen what each other do actually at that school together. And so you have to create up create systems where people are exposed to the powerful things that are happening on the campus. And you have to have ways of sharing those things. And uh, there's probably people in your system, for example, that have solved problems that you have in your classroom. And unless there's good communication lines, you, you'll never know that. That's why I love to the, you know, the, the movement now to empower um, more in-house professional development, for example, um, a more like a, an ed camp approach to professional development on campuses, a more personalized uh, professional development approach. And so start to empower teachers to, to take what it is that they're so special at, what they're good at, and to share that in the professional development on your campus. And find ways for teachers to be able to observe each other, find ways for teachers to be able to connect and collaborate, and, and not just within their uh, their subject area. But Teach Like a Pirate has a very cross-curricular approach to education, and that we're too much like this. We have blinders on, and we see our content, our grade level, or our subject, right? And so it's having that cross-curricular approach and the connections uh, across your campus that is gonna really help I think drive the ball forward. And by the way, um, now this is going to be a little bit of a rant. Do you mind if I go on a rant? <laughs> we will welcome that rant and let it rip, man. Okay. And you're like, you're thinking to yourself, like, wait, this is going to be a rant. Like, what is the rest <laughs> of this stuff, man? Okay. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, <laughs> didn't that start already? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're 34 minutes into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this, I think this is important, and that's my snowball analogy for cultural change on a campus. And uh, long story short, when I say that, that means it's going to be a long story anyway, by the way. <laughs> All right, so uh, anyway, if, if you want to build a giant snowball and you go out into the snow and you try to grab it all up in your arms all at one time, what happens? You don't get a very good snowball. It, it all crumbles away from you and, and you end up with nothing, right? 
That's not the way you build a snowball. The way you build a snowball is you get a little bit in your hands and you pack it tight and you shape it and you mold it. And then after working with it, shape it in and get it nice and tight, you, you add a little bit more. And then you add a little bit more and, and you shape and pack that. And then pretty soon it gets big enough where you can set it on the ground. And when you set it on the ground, then you can actually push it and roll it and the snow will start to, st start to stick. And, and that's how you eventually build a giant snowball. But it always starts with that little bit that you had in your hand. And that's the same way I look at changing the culture of a school system, is too many people want to go out and try to grab everybody at once. And then it all crumbles away from them they end up with nothing change isn't something that you can announce from the podium right you can't hand out an eye patch on the first day of school and say hey we're all gonna be pirates this year let's go let's get in our classes and and, and expect to have any sort of impact in your class, right? Now, it always starts with a small group. You find the people on your campus who are interested in trying something new, who do want to be a part of something innovative, and, and you work with them, and you put your energy there, and you pack it tight, and you shape it, and you mold it, and it's the energy that radiates out from that group that starts to attract other people in and they say hey I want to be a part of that stuff over there and all of a sudden you add them to the mix and you add them to the fold and you bring more people in right and then pretty soon you have enough people where you have a little momentum and you can actually set it down in your system and start to roll it across and have it change your campus have it change your district right but it always starts with that small little group in a room that says, hey, let's give this a shot, or the, hey, let's jump, let's, let's do a book study on this and, and be a part of this. It might be three, five, ten teachers at the school, but then that energy that radiates out from them will start to attract and bring other people in. And so you always want to look for the snowball, uh, the people that are going to be part of the snowball in your system, and the people that do want to join you. And, um, you know, so like often what happens is we let, uh, like leaders, let their energy be dissipated by trying to uh, bring in the, the most negative elements on their staff into the fold right away, okay? And then their energy gets dissipated and nothing ever gets done. So rather than letting that energy go to the negativity on your staff, focus that energy on where it's gonna really have an impact and that's where the people that really do wanna go forward and then pretty soon that momentum is gonna, will tumble over everybody else and, and, and change your whole system's culture. I love it. Love it. Building culture piece by piece, one interaction at a time, one book study at a time, whatever that happens to be, piece by piece. And that snowball analogy is absolutely fantastic. And you hit on a really great thing, too, when you're talking about the exposure and getting people in other, cl in other classrooms and, and things like that. So much can be learned. I know we've got a physical education teacher. He might be our best classroom manager on the entire campus. That's so much, regardless of that content area or whatever it is. So much can be picked up from that. So I'm, I'm very glad that you hit on that, Dave. We appreciate it. You bet. And I, I think you make a really good point, Dave, of, you know, hey, let's, uh, the huge initiatives of, hey, let's be pirates this year. You know, without, without proper uh, implementation, you can't just be a pirate when you wake up in the morning. So uh, I yeah. appreciate that. Hey, uh, by the way, I, I, love, I love what Diane just said. I just pop, popped over to Twitter. She says, uh, Kind of funny hearing it from a San Diego teacher, though. <laughs> the snowball analogy. Yeah, the snowball, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it works great in Iowa, though. Perfect for us. Uh, uh, we got a, <laughs> another question uh, from the crowd uh, from Christina Aronin. Um, what best approach does a leader take to encourage staff who like their rut to light themselves up with enthusiasm? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, there's a, uh, a whole section on, um, in Lead Like a Pirate, for example, on culture building on campus and how, to, and how that, that grassroots culture building and trying to draw them in to the, create a shared vision for your school, for your system. And one of the quotes in the book is that people are less likely to tear down um, systems that they help build. And so um, getting that shared vision and that shared leadership across your campus, it can be a powerful thing to, to, to bring, to drag people in. But again, at the same time, um, it kind of goes back to that snowball thing is that sometimes you don't, sometimes it's not that you're going to directly address that uh, negativity and that person that's in the rut. You're going to address the people around them that do want to do something. And then uh, they're, they're going to get swept up into the movement. And if they don't, don't get swept up in the movement, then maybe they might get swept out. And that's sometimes, that's why pirate ships have planks. <laughs> um, so 
I know you know my good friend Jimmy Casas, uh, who started this chat and uh, was my evaluator as a teacher. And he often talked to me about burnout. Uh, he he would he'd say, Colin, you I'm I'm no Dave Burgess by any means, but he'd say you bring passion, uh, a ton of passion to your classroom. You know, I'm I'm just a concerned if you continue to bring this much passion, how long can you do it? You know, so and and you obviously uh, our viewers can see have probably 10 times more passion than I have and I feel like I have a lot so how, how do how, how does someone implement the, the pirate model and, and avoid burnout yeah so this is uh, here's the deal um, we work in a job where we can never be done <laughs> that's dangerous like when, when was the last time you heard a teacher say, um, I've actually got everything all set for the next few weeks, <laughs> right? You, you, you've never heard it, not from a good one anyway, right? And, and so we can never be done. Not only can we never be done, not only is there always something more we can do, but we know how important what we do is as well. And so uh, that's, that's super dangerous because it makes us feel guilty at time that we spend outside of education. But every time, I have honored my outside passions and interests or been willing to develop new ones. It has always come back to inform my teaching. It's always made me a better teacher. And so every single time. And so if you, if you read Teach Like a Pirate, actually, there is not one single educational book that's referenced in Teach Like a Pirate. Not because I don't like educational books. It's because it was an outside-in approach. It was like, look, it's, it's a way of looking at the world and saying, how can I use that? Like, what is it around me that other people use to engage in other professions? And, and how can I use that, right? So it's like my background in marketing and entrepreneurship. How a marketer creates buzz for a new product, I create buzz for lessons, right? Um, my background as a coach has influenced my, how, I, how I deliver feedback to students and how I hopefully have an, more, an inspirational, motivational component to my class and how I break things down in, in, in instruction. My background as a magician has influenced my sense of staging and showmanship and, and use of props. My background in, as an MC has influenced my professional development speaking style. Like if you were to see me speak live at a conference, you're gonna probably say like, uh, first of all, you're gonna say, well, that guy's really intense. <laughs> um, but, but then also you're gonna go like, what well, now is this a show or is this professional development? Because it kind of seems like a little bit of both, right? So I'm a, per I'm a person who's used to speaking in front of people in a fast and flourishy way uh, as an MC. And so uh, it's all of these things drawn from my background have created the Teach Like a Pirate system and, and philosophy. And so um, not only will, when you get involved in other things outside of school, will you develop a more richer, more balanced life, which is going to help you in the classroom, but it's also going to give you creative ammunition from other fields that you can bring back into your school system, into your classroom in order to, to teach better. So don't feel guilty of time you spend outside of education. That's that recharge time that you need, and it's going to help you back in the classroom anyway. We've got another question from Brandon. And he, Brandon asks, "How does it feel?" Wait, wait, wait! Is this wait? Is this is this the second question from Brandon? Yes. I thought there was a one question limit tonight. What was the? Well, oh, okay. you uh, know, uh, kind of kind of a rule breaker. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so Brandon's right. maybe a rule breaker. So, <laughs> all right, Brandon. It, all right, Brandon. We'll go for it. He's saying, "How does it feel to be revolutionizing education?" There's so many <laughs> T, T Lab fans out there. So you can answer that how you want, but talk too about just kind of that TLAP hashtag that's going on as well that uh, has really taken off since obviously since the book has been released, but it's a whole, it's a, uh, it's a whole community of people. Yeah. So you know what? It's surreal that what's happened with Teach Like a Pirate and then now with the many of the other books as well. Um, and so, I mean, there's like, I think there's 27 different books right now that we've published. Um, and so, and, and many, and most of them have their own hashtag in their community. And, and so that community building is a big part of what we do. And so, um, I'm constantly inspired by the TLAP community and by the communities around the other books as well. And so some people say like, man, it must be, uh, you must, you, you must love the impact that you're having. And I always say like, oh, it's these people, it's these communities and what they're sharing that's really driving this message forward. So that's where uh, the credit lies. And, and so we, we work with people about this really, we work a lot about this. Here's the thing, 
Um, if you go out and try to sell your book, it feels icky. And uh, you, you feel like you're giving a sales message and maybe you don't do it as often as you should. You don't do it as well as you should because you feel like you're being pushy. And the person on the other end of it doesn't feel good either because they feel like they're being sold and nobody feels, likes to feel like they're being sold, right? So rather than go out and try to sell your book, go out and try to spread your message. You're on fire about, your, we tell authors, like, you're on fire about your message, that's why you came to us. Because you're looking for the best way to spread your message, and that's what we're good at. So just go out and try to spread your message, and when you and build a community around that message, and then be an authentic member of that community and support that community. And when you do that, the wonderful thing about the universe is that books will sell too. So so if you if you go if you go out and try to worry about your book sales, it doesn't work. But if you just become if you build a community and you support that community and become a member of that community then um, the universe is set up to reward you for, for, for that kind of a mentality. And that's why, that's why uh, so many of these, a lot of the, other, the big house publishers are struggling right now. They don't understand what's happening to them. Um, they don't understand why our books are selling. And it's because we're finding p powerful practitioners. People are actually out doing this stuff. We're freeing them up to write their, their story and then helping them build a community around it and to spread their their message. And so companies, what they want to do is they want to they want to they want the magic ad that they can put into the magazine, right? Or they want the the man if they if I could just craft a better sales pitch around this, then maybe I could sell as many books as uh, the pirate guy or what something like that. And it, it's not a sales pitch; it's a it's a community of people, and 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 that's that's what you do in today's world to to spread a message. So Dave, another question for you is, what's the best piece of advice that you would give to new teachers or new school leaders? Uh, so for new teachers, one of the things I always tell them is, so you're gonna come into this system and you're gonna be excited about the new innovative ideas you have and you have all this energy and you're, you, you might think that Everyone else, when you get there, is going to be just as excited as you are about the fact that you're bringing this new energy into the system, and you might be you might be surprised to find out that that's not the case. And so, a lot of a lot of new teachers are shocked because uh, they think that that's what they're going to find on their campus, and then they don't find that. And um, but you still have to teach in the way that you know is most powerful, and to you you have the ability to even even in a system of standards and teams. You can add your unique touch, your voice, your presentational uh, creativity to what you do in the classroom. And so you can't let a system that's entrenched in a certain way of teaching stop you from teaching in an innovative way, right? You can still be a part of a professional learning community. You can still be teaching your standards, have the same common assessment given at the end of the year and all that, but add your unique voice to what you do in your classroom. But then I, and I also tell them, um, here, here's the thing that will happen to me sometimes. A teacher will come up to me and say, I'm ready to quit. I'm not cut out for this. Total failure, disaster, things are going wrong. Um, everything's blowing up in my face. I thought this was gonna be different. And I'll say, well, hold on, slow down. What, what, tell me what happened. And then they'll, they'll explain a scenario to me where like 29 people in the classroom were actually pretty wildly engaged by what was happening. But one kid over in the corner popped off or said something rude or did something that kind of uh, that made the lesson blow up a little bit. And, and they'll walk away from that experience feeling like a failure. 29 people were, on, were, were into it. One person uh, was, was popped off and said something rude, right? And so life isn't 100% or fail. Okay, and so uh, teaching is messy, learning is messy. And so if you, if you set up a system in your career for success, that he, here's how you're gonna judge success. You have to have 100% engagement and 100% successful lessons on 100% of the days that you teach. You have just set up a system where you're gonna be guaranteed a lifetime of disappointment and frustration. That's not the way that it works. Even things like a teach like a pirate style lessons. It's not about perfect, uh, Nirvana style lessons. It's about better lessons. It's always trying to get better and trying to, you're, you're not going to get perfect 100% engagement. You're going to get better engagement. And so it's always having that kind of just that growth mindset of trying to um, move further and closer and, and improve your tactics. But uh, you, you can't let, can't let things that go wrong in the classroom. Everything that happens in the classroom is feedback. 
It's not failure, it's feedback. They're providing you the real-time gift of feedback to help you improve and hone your craft. And so you use that feedback. You don't personalize it. You don't beat yourself up about it. You don't beat kids up about it. You use it as feedback to make shifts in course and adjustments to get to where you, you need to go. <clears throat> love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Dave. By the way, I'm going to throw something else in because I feel another rant coming. <laughs> and here it is. Collaboration. Uh, I have a section in the book that's called Collaboration versus Killaboration. Collaboration with a C-O-L-L -L versus Killaboration with a K-I-L-L. -L. Uh, many, many systems have misunderstood the purposes of collaboration. Collaboration with a C is something that I advocate for everywhere I go, and it has made me a remarkably better teacher. I do it every chance I get. But collaboration with a C is about all of us coming together to get better, not all of us coming together to become the same. It's about improving education, not simply standardizing it. So I fight the cookie cutter at every single step and encourage teachers to fight the cookie cutter at every single step. It's not about we're going to all come together and create one thing that everyone's going to do exactly the same or we're going to stay on some script and everyone's going to be on the same word at the same time as you walk down the hallway uh, of the school or something like that. It's about coming together and sharing best practices and helping each other and pushing each other and helping each teacher be the best that they could possibly be within their skill set and, and their style. And so that, that's the true purpose of collaboration. I look at it like Napoleon Hill and how to think and grow rich, called it the mastermind principle, and that you want to create a mastermind. And that mastermind doesn't just have to be people that teach your subject, doesn't even have to be from your profession. I want to connect and collaborate with a mastermind. People that are going to push me, people that are going to share new ideas, people that are going to help me become the best I can become. I don't want to be a part of a master behind, mastermind or a PLC that just wants to, the, that the final goal is going to be that everyone's going to walk out like some sort of robot doing the same thing. I want to be, I want to be pushed and made better within my strengths and my style. Well, so we're, we're nearing the end here, my friend. Um, so I, I'll probably call this the last question. Um, if you could change one thing in education right now, today, what would it be? <sighs> That's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I, I think it would be the overemphasis on standardized test scores and uh, how that has increasingly narrowed our curriculum and driven our instruction. And, um, and I look at it like um, if you're, and, and, I, and I, wrote about, I wrote about this in the book, and it's uh, fan, fantasy, say something like fantasy football, okay? And so to me, I know lots of people are into fantasy football, and that's fine, right? But I, 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 think, I, I think that it leads to a twisted view of the game. I can remember, and I wrote this, uh, a neighbor kid of ours came over, and he, they were in a kid fantasy football league. And I saw, um, it was, I think it was, uh, it, it was a Charger game and it was Rivers and I can't remember who the receiver was at this time, uh, threw, threw a, a touchdown pass to the Charger receiver and was going, this, this kid is a Charger fan since the day he was been born, this is the day he was born, okay? And I saw him going like, no, no, what's happening? No. And it turns out that he was in a close battle in his fantasy football game with someone who had uh, Philip Rivers as their quarterback. And he, so he was cheering against the Chargers because of the, the because he didn't want the Philip Rivers to get that, to get those points. Okay. And, and so I see people that'll say, uh, like the, run, the running back had a bad game. Well, but then you look back at it, and the running back made all of the key blocks that freed up the other players to score. But a fantasy football player will say, yeah, but they didn't, they didn't get the points, right? And, and so uh, about, as a basketball coach, I don't just look at the person who shot and made the three-pointer. I see the person who set the correct angled screen to free up the three-point shooter. 
and the person, the passer, that hit the three-point shooter right in his hands so he was able to get the shot off in, in, in a quicker fashion. And the person who repositioned themselves onto the other side of the court to get better spacing so that there was not congestion for the three-point shooter to come off the screen. And all these things are complicated and they lead to a successful basketball play. Or, or the person who boxed out, but someone else got the rebound, but they boxed out the best rebound on the other team, which allowed their teammate to get the rebound. That, does, that stuff doesn't show up on the stat sheet. And, and so people look at the stat sheet the next morning in the paper, and they'll talk about who the best players in the game were. And I think they're missing the bigger picture of what happened in the game. And that's what happens in education, too, is we're too caught up in the stat sheet. And we miss the really important stuff that is, that's happening happen in education and so it, it's not just about the statistics we have a larger purpose for what we're doing and so uh, don't have a fantasy football driven view of education where you just want to know what, how many points they got on the on the test right it, it's it's so much bigger than that um, it's so it's so much more important than that and, and so I, I can't stand that fantasy football nature that we look at education right now with 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 those those points and, and one of the ways i look at this too so like if you ask me when i'm teaching my civil rights movement um civil rights movement lessons in my unit what's more important to me that a kid can tell me everything that's in the civil rights act of 1964 or that they're going to not be racist and not only not be racist but they're going to stand up and fight injustice when they see it in the world around them and they're gonna have the courage to step forward and stop something from happening maybe that, that they know is an injustice. Well, only one of those things is on the test and it's not the most important one, right? And so I'm never gonna judge the success of my civil rights movement unit by how many kids answered question 14 correctly, right? I wanna see what, are, what, what kind of people did they become when, when they left my classroom? And so uh, that, that test-driven mentality is the one thing I would change. I appreciate that. And that uh, what a great response. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to share some resources. Obviously, you know them. Uh, obviously, your hashtag uh, TLAP, T-L-A-P, uh, is a big resource, along with your website, um, uh, DaveBurgess.com. No www, just DaveBurgess.com. And then... Uh, Twitter handle is at Burgess Dave. So uh, we want to take this time and give you a, a chance to wrap up, Dave. Is there anything, any closing comment, statement you'd like to share as a final thought? Yeah, don't let this be a one-time thing. Get connected. Feel, uh, follow me on Twitter. If you're not following me, I'll follow you back. Um, get involved in the hashtag. TLAP is on Monday nights at uh, 8 central time. Um, but we have all sorts of hashtags around, all, around our books and, and different communities and chats. But TLAP is kind of the mothership where you're going to find stuff. Um, if you want to get uh, a free Google Drive folder of all of digital quote posters, totally free, and access to the blog, get it in the blog when I write them, um, go to daybirds.com, sign up for the email list. And uh, thank you so much for having me on Iowa Ed Chat. What an amazing community that you guys have built. And it's inspiring to see how many people come together on a Sunday night, um, you know, work all week, but then come together on a Sunday night to just talk about education and to help each other get better. And so you guys are doing a remarkable thing with Iowa Ed Chat. And so I really appreciate that. Thanks again, Dave, for taking time out of and spending an hour with us and our, and our followers and fans. and. Uh, obviously, I think our activity tonight also comes uh, with your uh, huge following. So, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us tonight. I'm going to share some upcoming Iowa regional and national events. Uh, we have BC Ed Camp focused on uh, coming to you in June 15th. Uh, the Keystone Premier Educational Conference, May 21st in Dubuque. Um, and if you have any other uh, regional or na national events you'd like us to share, please uh, let us know. And I'm going to pass it off to my man, Dan, to close her out. Thanks, Colin. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts on Iowa Ed Chat Live. It is always great learning with all of you. Very special guests, or very special thank you to our guest tonight, Dave Burgess, and to the rest of our Iowa Ed Chat team, Colin Wicken and Andrea Townsley. Be sure to follow some of the new friends you met here tonight and visit hashtag IAEdChat to continue the conversation. 
We will be back next week with another great topic. And until next time, good night, everybody.